Welcome to Season 4 of Book Eaters Podcast. This season we'll be exploring the best books of the year. One might call them literary darlings. But how are we going to decide that, Michelle? We aren't. We're going to leave that to the experts. Each episode we will defer to one of those experts. Goodreads, The Pulitzer, Publishers Weekly. The Oddies. Okay. To see how they hold up. And if we can keep up. Abel will read the book. And Michelle will listen to it. Then we'll pour ourselves a drink. Or two. This season we're making classic cocktails. And then we will take a sip down Literary Lane. For some bookish banter. Join Join us. us. Let's dive right in. The expert of this episode is the USA Today bestsellers list. The USA bestsellers list published its last list on December 1st, 2022, promising an update in the future and proclaiming it was only on hiatus. But it did have this to say. The USA Today list began in 1993 and is a ranking of the top-selling titles each week from a broad range of retail outlets, including major chains, independent bookstores, and online retailers. It reflects combined sales of titles in print and electronic format if available. Using that data, they determine the week's 150 top-selling titles. The rankings reflect sales from the previous Monday through Sunday. So it was basically just whoever may sold the most books. And it was one of the few that had a lot of genre fiction, including like romance on it. And it always felt to me like it was more of like an everyman's list. I love that. Yeah. So those of us that preferred our a little more speculative and a little less literary fiction could probably find some reads that we'd be interested there as opposed to some of the other lists. Usually I do love anything that's every man, but if this book (laughs) is indicative, what are you Which leads us to the next thing. The number one book on the last published (laughs) list was It Starts With Us, but that's a sequel. So April and I decided to read It Ends With Us by Colleen Hoover, which was actually number four. Which says something that, you know. The, People love it. The first book is still on the list. It Ends With Us is a story about Lily Bloom, a young woman who meets a sexy neurosurgeon in Boston named Kyle Kincaid after giving a particularly passive-aggressive eulogy at her father's funeral in Maine. The story centers around her relationship with Ryle, how that relationship mirrors her parents' abusive marriage, and a love from her past that complicates her feelings. Nicely done. Thank you. And I had some trouble deciding what cocktail we were going to drink, but I just Googled, um, because Boston is a feature in in this story. Absolutely. Everything's better in Boston. (laughs) Better in Boston. So I just Googled, what is the number one classic cocktail in Boston? And of no surprise, it's a Cape Cod, which is... Basically just vodka, cranberry juice, and a splash of lime. So that is what we'll be drinking today. Cheers. Cheers. So let's get into it. Can you say it with a Boston accent? No. The Cape Cod. I'm terrible at accents. It's like my car. (laughs) I'm terrible at accents. Yeah. That wasn't very good. (laughs) I'm going to be honest. Although this Cape Cod is good. Yeah, that's not bad. That's Yeah, that's very refreshing and not too heavy. Fun story. Like uh, in my 20s. And in my 30s, it was like my go-to drink when I would go to bars. Did you call it a Cape Cod? No, I would say cranberry soda tall. That was how I would order it. Oh. Um, but usually they put a lime in it. Anyway, so I think pretty much this was my class. And then I then I became like calorie conscious, as you do in this diet culture world. So I switched to vodka soda with just a splash of cranberry to save me that 20 calories. Per drink. <laughs> but you could also feel virtuous as you ordered it yeah maybe maybe there's some of that yeah so let's like, talk- look at me being good like when i you know order a big mac and fries and a coke zero <laughs> 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 all right um all right act. it's fine let's let's talk about uh the what we liked about the book what buttered our bread um, did you have something you wanted to say? I mean, maybe you should start. All right, I'll start. Um, so there's a couple of things about the book <laughs> that I like. So first off, when I was reading the book, at first, uh, the first thing I read was the dedication. I was like, that's passive aggressive dedication. And then immediately the obituary, the obituary, the, the eulogy was also kind of the same level of passive aggressive. And I was like, all right, so she did a good job of foreshadowing what was to come. I mm-hmm. thought that was that was an interesting foreshadow. And then also she does a really good job, I think, with Ryle as a character. Because I immediately hated him. And I was like, why aren't you seeing all these red flags, girl? Why are you paying attention? Like, I cannot believe that you're not paying attention to these red flags. And 
I often feel this way when I'm reading romance novels because a lot of times characters are written poorly and what people think is sexy to them is not sexy to me. But maybe it's not written poorly. But I don't think it's sexy. I think it's frightening and a little concerning. But in this case, those were good instincts because it turns out he was not as nice as we think he is. So that was nicely done because he was written in such a, a balanced way where like you were never really sure in the beginning if he was going to be So you didn't get attached. Not. You didn't get attached and I then have your heart broken. No, my heart was not broken. But I also felt like that was good because as a reader, as a third party observer, it was good that I, you know what I mean? I like you could see her falling for or whatever. I thought that was, that was cleverly done. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Did you have the same feelings about Ryle or what did you think about him? Um, I was very confused by that character and we'll get more into that when we want to throw bathwaters and babies okay. around. Sure. I loved Atlas. Yeah. I thought that was a good character. Yeah. Um, I thought, I love that name too, which I'd never thought of as a name, but Atlas. That's, yeah. That's great. I bet he does a lot of shrugging. <laughs> But um, but yeah, I loved that that character. Um, I also loved sort of the growth of her understanding her mother, mm-hmm. and her mother also getting sort of a second chance that at was, life. Yeah. Um, that was nice. Also, I would probably shop at that flower store. I thought of you immediately. I was like, oh, no, they're going to take away April's flower <laughs> joy. I hope it's not her idea exactly. So that was good that it kind of skirted it a little. Um, I, But, yeah, I mean, to me, the best part was the relationship with Atlas. And just it kind of reminded me of one of my favorite sort of coming of age you might yeah. say, um, <laughs> romances, which is Eleanor in part by Rainbow Rowell, who I love. And it's just this really, you know, I loved that whole, it's a, just a gentle love story. And it is, I love that she saved the magnet. Mm-hmm. I loved that his restaurant was called Bibbs. I love that they, and, and the other thing to remember, and I had to keep reminding myself even at points of frustration in the book, Mm-hmm. She was only 23 years old. Yeah. Yeah, at the, at the start of the story, which is so yeah. young. And so a, I I was able to forgive the main character Lily more easily because she was so young. Yeah, that's why I thought maybe this was more of a new adult book than like a romance because it's listed as a romance, but I have trouble classifying it that way. Um, but it does feel very new adult. But then he was older, right? Ryle was like 28. He had to have been because he was a neurosurgeon. Yeah, he was almost 30. I remember right. that reference. So I also really liked the sister. I thought she was uh, was a fun character. I loved how what you would... I mean, I had some problems with that character. But I did love that she was genuine. And yeah. I loved that... Even when she obviously loved her brother, um, but she genuinely loved Lily Mm -hmm. and understood that Lily's safety uh, and because so many times the family of the abuser excuses the behavior. Right. And I was afraid and that's what Lily was afraid of. But no, she said, I love my brother, but please do not go back to him. You know, yeah. and so I appreciated that. I thought Marshall was cool. I mean, it was very. Uh, he was very one dimensional. Very one dimensional. I'm yeah. not even sure what he was doing. But, Somehow that's getting into yeah, the bathwater. Yeah. yeah. So another thing, I, there was some some messaging that I didn't like, but there was some messaging in the story that I that I did like, although I didn't necessarily like the way that it was executed. But I think it's worth mentioning that there was some messaging. Like, like I really like this. This whole idea of how kids, especially kids that are like 18 years old in that cusp, how they're just out there on their own. I mean, I don't I mean, foster care systems, it happens all the time. People just age out of the system and then they're stuck. I and mean, that wasn't his, his Alice's sitch, whatever. But it's still an important thing that people need to like pay attention to and see. And I like that that messaging was there. I did think about that attention. because of, I did think about you a lot because of how close you are to the fostering, yeah. you know, uh, per, you know, 
pitfalls and rewards of that. But yeah, there's not really a safety. But I have to believe that if you're still in high school, there would still be some resources. Mm, if you're 18. I mean, the, the rules are very specific. Like even foster care kids who turn 18, their senior years, because they were born in the summer or whatever, they also can be aged out and then have nowhere to go. Like that's not... A, that's so that's not, a huge gap in it's our a, system. It's a problem. And I think that it's great that this book called attention to that. Um, I, 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 you know, and I think it also calls attention a lot to the fact that the women who are being abused are not at fault and that we need to stop blaming them. Um, I did have some reservations about the way that it was brought up, but, but I think that's an important message as well. So I liked some of the messaging. Yeah, her intent was definitely there. Um, in, in the story and yeah, I like the idea of the, of the, of the restaurant and the bookstore and I mean the flower shop and the, we're grasping at straws. We really are. I mean, let's, can we just get into the bathroom? Let's move on. Let's move on to Because I mean, even the restaurant, man. Yeah. If it was going to be that great of a restaurant, why didn't she describe some of the dishes? Yeah. I mean. I figured out that it was his, was his restaurant right away. As soon as it flipped back to him making the best cookies of her life, yeah, I was like, there's no way he's just a waiter in that restaurant. He's the chef. I did not see that. because No, because she needed to make the... She, he needed to be successful, too. You know what I mean? Yeah. To be, no, for sure. So, yeah, he anyways, needed to overcome but it. That was a big problem that I had with the book, is it was very lazy writing. And I know I'm a snob, and this was every man's book. But I have to believe mm -hmm. that people, the people want more than that. Especially for such a sensitive topic, it, it felt very, she didn't research anything. It, I mean, I'm not a fan of Coho in general, right? Like, I didn't like Verity. Oh, is that is that your name for her? Colleen Hoover, that's what that's the kids are calling her. Coho? I'm not, I'm not a huge fan of her in general. Like I don't, I don't like her writing style. I definitely don't like the genre that this was. It was not like a clean cut romance. So it's hard for me to be objective. But I do think the writing was terrible, and I do think that it felt like very like like just they're falling in love, right? So like she meets this guy, and immediately I'm angry about it. And there's no like, there's no like reason why she should be in love with him, right? Other than the whole like he's a neurosurgeon. I mean, whatever. Like, there's just like, and then they, they don't show them falling in love. So like, they reveal. Yeah, like she's all like, "Oh no, I don't do one night stands." And he's like, "I only do one night stands." And then all of a sudden, she's like, "Sure, I'll. I just want to have sex with you." And he's suddenly, like, "Yeah, we'll give it a trial." I mean, there's no. Yeah, there's yeah, no. Very, but also, like, usually when people get together, there's like a get to know you phase, and this would have been a perfect place. For them to reveal the backstory with Atlas and for them to reveal the story with him shooting the brother. Instead, we get this journal, which really was painful to oh. listen to. It felt like I was oh my God. it felt like I was listening to a journal of an actual high school kid. And Oh, I felt the opposite. I was like, this is <sighs> so obviously not a high school kid. Oh, a high school kid does not use the, there, it was too mature for a high school kid. Yeah, this weird obsession with Ellen DeGeneres was also strange, especially given the current climate with her. I don't know. So like it just, it was, they could have, it could have been revealed that way in that relationship so that she was telling him the stories and then he could have told her the stories about his brother and then we could see them connecting mm -hmm. and then that would have been a good way and then it would have made more sense. But then no, and so we get this, like, he's spying on her and then he's, like, angry. I guess they needed that for that, I guess. I don't know. I just, well, I mean, yeah. felt like there was no, like, the getting to know you phase was just gone and it was right from... We want to fuck to we want to get married, which there's usually like at least like a month in there where you're like learning their favorite color. I sort of excused that because there was, you know, when it comes to abusive relationships, mm -hmm. there is that love bombing that happens. There wasn't any love bombing. Well, he did. Well, I think that's what she was trying to show, but it came across as just like, like there was one, uh, you know, section where it was. He tried to tech. I mean, this was like early in their relationship and she had been busy. She's trying to start her own business, you know. Right. And he and she didn't have her phone on her and he texted her a few times and she hadn't responded. And then finally she picks up her phone or maybe she was reading the diaries or something. But she finally picks up her phone mm -hmm. 
and sees that she missed some texts from him. And she's like, oh, I missed some texts from him. And then she, he's like, are you asleep? And then he's like, I, I guess so. And then when she finally sees the messages, she's like, nope, still up. And he's like, good, because I'm coming up your stairs right now. That's a red flag for me. <laughs> but like just him like showing up at her house in the beginning was a red flag. There was so many red so flags. So many red flags. But I think that that was by design because his character is abusive and there he's not a he's but he's problematic. Love, I think it's supposed to be the love bombing and then he buys her the apartment and then, you know it's just all this stuff, right? Yeah. But mm. my I hate, hated the character of Ryle. I thought it was so unrealistic. There were so many parts about this book where I kept waiting yeah for the other shoe to drop Uh i had like i figured out that atlas was the chef very early Mm -hmm. i thought i had figured out a lot of things that didn't come to pass because what the characters did didn't make any sense and so i kept trying to think well this is weird there's a reason why they're so like i went through believing kyle ryle wasn't a neurosurgeon um because first of all he came over with his stethoscope still around his neck. That would never happen. Even him being in scrubs as a surgeon is weird because you're the whole point of the surgical scrubs is that you don't put them on until you're in the locker room before you go into surgery. Well, I mean, clearly and she then didn't when do you, any research. She did no research. Yeah. And then it was also um, really weird because he, he'd never talked about the compassionate side of one. Even when he, like, the big thing was, like, him being able to do the surgery on the conjoined twins. And he was just looking forward to it and excited about it. There was nothing about, hey, I have a chance to make a big difference in these little babies' lives, you know. That's a, yeah. Uh, so, I mean, uh, that whole, all of that seemed very weird to me. There was also Alyssa, the sister that mm-hmm. you love so much. Her just, uh, suddenly her husband makes $6 million a year because he's some magic he money. some software or something. And but she still just wants to keep her hand in, so she's just going to work uh, at the flower shop. So it made me think, oh, maybe the, that whole family is in on some sort of con, you know? <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, and I kept thinking uh, that she's a plant because what are the chances? You're a plant. Ju- you're- <laughs> <laughs> uh, because because what are the chances that she would just happen in randomly and? see this woman starting a business and be like, I just want a job. It doesn't matter what you're paying. $10 an hour is fine. And my white capris. And then that just happens, happens to, to be, be the his brother. sister. Yeah. So I was like, yeah. oh, no, she didn't just accidentally show up. He, You know, I thought it was like some big conspiracy or something. I also thought that Atlas was actually the older brother that everybody thought was dead. I had so many crazy... Jesus thoughts because nothing these characters did made any fucking sense. I mean, I, I didn't. So there had to be some crazy thing to explain <laughs> why it was unfolding the way that it was. But no, it I didn't turns have out any, I didn't have any of that. Like I kind of figured it was a straightforward story. I mean, they already had that sense. I was like, oh, there's something more going on when I read that one. But this one, I didn't. I felt like, okay, this was just a straightforward. Abuse, you know, sleeping with the enemy situation, <laughs> and you know, it's her take on it. And I, and I have some problems, like some real problems with her take on it. First of all, and I'm just gonna jump right to it because yeah. it, it, when I, I was, it was so mad at the. We're end of so the book. sorry, Coho fans, but you need to hear the truth. I was so mad because she, at the end of the story, yes, she leaves him, yay, good for her. But then she gives him, just gives him custody, like part custody of the child. Like, just because one experience with an abuser meant that the kid didn't get hurt, that is not everyone's experience. I mean, her And own- it seems very unlikely that that's actually what happened. And so I'm, it concerns me, like, you would just give your child, like, your child to this person that you think may make, that it hit you, abused you, you just let them have the kid, your infant child? What? Especially, what? especially since her own experience was that, her dad never hit her, never abused her. It was always directed to her mother until it wasn't. Until it wasn't, until he, that one time. And then plus she saw him beat the shit out of Atlas, right? Like, this is this is like, I would think, especially given her closeness, she would understand that that was stupid. But then, 
I don't know. Did you read the end? The end where Colleen Hoover talks about her own personal life. I did, and that is probably that's and that's probably why I, but, I go back to uh, that. Maybe that being my buttered bread because I did forgive a lot in the book after reading the author's note. Yeah, and there was a you know sort of two thirds of the way through. Yeah, when she was finding the courage to leave. I started kind of like, okay, I'll, I see what she's trying to do. She's trying to explain how hard it is for people to leave. Because when you love someone, mm-hmm. you know, it is, you you that you love them. And you don't, you want to believe the best in them. And you want to forgive. And you want to honor your vows. And you, all of this, mm-hmm. right? So I get what she was trying to do, especially after reading the author's note. But she did, again, she didn't do her research. She based it, I think, just on her own like trying to tell her mother's story, which is one tiny little, you know. Which I think is, it, I mean, no, I think that's fine. Except that, for the dangerous because now you're telling women who leave that, that the husband's not going to hit the kid. Like you're giving that example, that sort of nugget out there. Yeah, but I feel like anybody from the outside looking in, as always, can see the red flags and can be like, oh, you shouldn't do that. I think what she was trying to do was be generous and say that people with trauma may sometimes not be in control of their own actions and they have a second chance too. Everybody loves a redemption arc, you know? No, I mean, I, but I'm fine with that. I'm not saying she should have ruined his career or put him in jail, but which I would have done actually. But <laughs> I, I think that it's, I think that it's fine until the baby was left alone with him. Mm-hmm. Like that's when I was like, wait a second. Yeah. I'm not sure I'm not a fan of that. Well, also her. His trauma did not make sense for why he acted the way that he acted. Mm -mm. You know, it made no sense. I feel like she, again, she didn't do any research about what can create an abuser. She just tried to think of a traumatic event. I, I don't know what she was thinking. But it doesn't, you know, if you, and I'm not a psychologist either, but. Yeah. If you accidentally harmed someone as a child, yeah, and it was truly, and that's why I kept waiting for that too. Like, oh, he didn't accidentally shoot his brother; he did it on purpose because he's some sort of sociopath. Again, that didn't. No. So, uh, her, her literally the premise was that as a child he accidentally shot and killed his brother, and now that's made him a rageaholic, abusive person. He has no control over his actions when he gets upset, and he'll just. I mean, I, I, I mean, maybe that could happen, but why not talk about talk about that? Why not, you know, if that's yeah. what the point of your book is, is to show shed light on abusers and that, in fact, they are they are not in control and they are not responsible for their actions, which is all the more reason why you can't trust them. Right. That's not what she did. You yeah. know, she's just it was lazy and. Yeah. Also, when she talks about, like, like, remember before I was talking about, like, the whole, like, seeing people, the 18-year-old. Like, her solution was to, like, ask everybody if they gave to charity. And then, like... what? Well, it was so weird. I was like, what is... What? And then she was going to start a charity, but then nothing Didn't. came of that. Yeah. It was so... Just so weird. What? Why? Why is this so popular? Oh, I'll tell you what another weird thing is. What? Which you probably do not get in the audiobook. Okay. I, I know you don't. You don't even get it in the, like, physical book. But I read it on Kindle. Oh. And the truly frightening thing mm-hmm. is that you can see what is the most highlighted sections of the book. Oh. And it's... Like the most, one of the most highlighted ones is when you, you're like forgiving someone for a mistake, and um, you know that mistakes have. I can't remember the exact passage, but it was truly frightening. The, the The most highlighted sections were not her walking away; it was her forgiving, her honoring her vows. Oh. Uh, that is w- women, and oh, another good thing is that clearly. Being that I'm going to assume that most of the purchasers of this book are women. So, hey, women, 
we have such a collective, you know, purchasing power that we can shoot a book to the top of the lists and keep it there even after its sequel comes out. So, hey, good job, women. <laughs> good job reading. Good job being into books. But ladies, we're better than this. <laughs> I, think, I think in this case that you and I can both agree. Uh, this may be the first time we both agree <laughs> on a on a book mm -hmm. uh yeah it's it's not it's it's not great it's problematic i didn't i didn't love it and i don't hate coho as much i mean i've only read one other book by her i read verity you, read you verity hated well. it yeah i hated it i actually again i mean there's like a kernel there like i loved like the building of suspense in that book but she's such a lazy uh, i'm sorry coho but yeah, I mean, again, she she's written books, and I've I mean, not written one. So you know, she's, she's already got a, a lot of books, and they're all doing really, really well, very, very, very well. I wonder if there's like book snobs when it comes to like horror that say this kind of stuff about Stephen King. You I think know? in general, people um, when they complain about Stephen King, it's usually that he's too wordy. Yeah, but his ideas are really good, and they're also really original. This is not an original idea. This is a... I feel sad because this could have been her best book because it did have that personal... Mm -hmm. But she didn't... She didn't research it. She... Uh, I'm just... No, I'm sorry. I've just got to be straight up. It was not a good book. I did not enjoy it. And I... To be fair, I don't normally enjoy this kind of book either. Like, I'm not a fan... I'd probably like it if I was her friend. I'm not a or fan... Or her mom. ...of this kind of story where people are be like it's just dark and whatever and then I'm the okay with that felt the ending was felt forced I'm okay with that I can read a dark book I can read but but it was just unsuc I mean it's I it was unsuccessful to me clearly it was a very successful book right you know it has a sequel and you know that says a lot I just don't know what's what's wrong with us that this is the thing that people are buying when there's so many truly good books out there. I think, I mean, is it, is it the, the publishers are just better? I don't, why does this author get so much support and attention? And then all these books that we read that are so, so good and nobody knows about. I think that there's a, there's a level of like voyeurism. Like people like these sort of, sort of, topics it's like why some of the other authors that we've talked about in the past that have the similar kind of style of mm -hmm. writing mm -hmm. um jody picot jody picot right like there's there's We're like saying a, her name right now there's like a a weird like desire for that and then also i think the writing on the level that she's writing at is very easy to understand it's very easy to follow it's not heavy in metaphor it's not hard to read right. you don't yeah. have to like think about it you know what i mean you can just sit down but there's a lot of books that have that that are good well i mean i agree but they don't have the same kind of content you know, you know what it makes me think of and i think you're right and you're onto something i wonder if these kinds of books have sort of replaced uh soap operas you know because soap operas too very shitty writing yeah very poorly like taking like buzzwords and trying to seize on things, you know, mm -hmm. hot topics of the day, but not really deep diving deep into them, just very superficial. Right. The, I feel like that's what it's doing. And and soap operas did the exact same thing. It was something very, you know, you didn't have to dive too deep. You just could just, you know. But I know a lot of people who read this book and cried. People cried during All My Children when I Erica... I had, like, zero <laughs> emotional attachment. And I compared it a lot to Finding Me, which is a book we read earlier in this mm -hmm. season, and how compelled I was by that violence and domestic violence. Right. And how, in contrast to that, this was a sort of... And I, and I don't... They're, just, they're real, very visceral. They're both telling stories from, from a, you know, whatever, a place of truth you know it was very visceral it was very i was very connected to it yeah i was in the moment when it was happening whereas this one i felt very far removed you know and i was okay this is but happening. that's what people want apparently but you i know? think that that makes a difference like i think if you can remove yourself from the story and watch it that way you get 
that sort of sense of empathy without having to actually fully engage. And, and I that's think that what, that's beneficial. And so that's what the people are wanting. Maybe. They're wanting to eat with a spoon and we're trying to eat with a fork. Well, I mean, I don't want to snob it out here. <laughs> I, I like I like to read trash too, but I I just feel like it it's oh, just not for me. It's just I not like, for me. Okay, but let's I, be, I'm not doing another Colleen Hoover book. I'm okay. not deal ever again but just to be clear i don't mind reading trash either i just hate reading trash that pretends that it's not trash well, i don't know that it's you think that it's going around pretending it's not trash coho is definitely pretending it's not trash well yeah this one for, for sure because of the um yeah because it's not okay. to her it's not trash to her it's important to her it was important which is another thing, like the thing at the end made me feel guilty about all my feelings of hatred for it the whole time, you know? Like I was at the end, I was like, oh, shit. She really cares about this. And, I, that, and yeah. I've been making fun of it in my head for like two hours. You know, I felt it was a fast read. Yeah, there was that. It there was, was, it was very fast. quick. Very, yeah. There, there was that as well. The narrator was fine. I, yeah. I'm not, I didn't read, listen to it. I listened so. to it. I'm saying the narrator was fine. She was... Not great. She was not bad. She it was, was one voice. Just one voice. She did all the characters. She was good um, enough, you know. But clearly... I listened to it toward the end. I should listen to it on a fast speed. Oh, that's surely a sign. Because I was like over it. I was like, oh, all right, let's kick it up. So it, this does a disservice to the, the narrator when I do that. But let me read to you some of my notes. Okay. Because um, just maybe you can guess what part I was at. I first, what a passive aggressive dedication which obviously was talking about the eulogy not dedication oh i actually and then i was like wait where was the funeral for parents didn't live in the same city so this is a part of me not understanding how small cities on the east coast are because i'm from arizona and like if i had to go to colorado that'd be like a nine hour drive so i'm guessing maine and boston are not that not far like apart. two hours but i was like what and then i was like jumping around jarring i don't know what that was something must have happened and then I was like, she recognizes his arms because there's like a scene where like, like when she's in that, when she's in the, uh, the flower shop and he like comes in and she like sees just his arms and recognizes him. I was like, <laughs> I mean, I know I have facial blindness and I've got some problems with recognition, but come on now. She met him once in the dark and she recognizes his arms. It's fine. Um, seriously, she's just going to fuck him. Gross. Not buying it. She'd be way more cautious given her father's violence. So this is before I knew that he was an abuser because I didn't read the thing. Mm -hmm. But I was like, what? And then I was like, ugh, domestic violence. So he knocked her unconscious. As a neurosurgeon, he would know about brain injuries. Like, he, like, knocks her unconscious and then leaves. Yeah, that was the, that was the other thing what made me also, think he just, wasn't – that's why I thought he wasn't a doctor because he wasn't, like, if, actually tending to injuries if at If someone all. goes unconscious, like, is knocked unconscious by, like, a physical attack – that's a serious injury. You must go to the hospital or you may die. That's not a, like, in the movies, oh, I woke up and everything's Yeah, fuzzy. but... That's I, legit. If you are knocked unconscious by someone, you are in danger of death. Your brain might swell. You need to go to the hospital immediately. When, when novelists do this or they do it on TV, it is not true. You cannot be knocked unconscious and then just be fine. But it does explain why maybe he didn't encourage her to go because he was afraid that he would be caught out you know right and then i was like she misses all these red flags and then now he's ready and then i wrote the problem is the falling in love is all sex where is the you you tell me your story i tell you mine this and then the, i already talked about the thing that i talked about how i think that they should have because it was all chemistry which you can't very well but she was 23 i mean like I at 23 you could confuse that like i understand chemistry and it's, it's difficult to put that on the page that the feeling the chemistry that like you know like the need to I did, ha I did have a couple of notes, too, where it was like, he was like, uh, he's supposed to be the one that just wants sex. And she's the one that's supposed to be like, no, I want to slow down. I don't do one night stands. I want a relationship. And then he comes straight from surgery. Oh, he's in his scrubs. And he oh, comes Jesus. over. And, yeah, very into that. And he's like, I'm sorry. I've, you know, just came off of an 18 hour shift i know you want hot and heavy sex but i just need to crash i'm like no that's not the dynamic he's the one that just wants to have sex and she's the one that wants to take it slow so it doesn't so like so or something much of it well no i think it's just lazy writing yeah i mean it's not great that's for sure and it did feel very much like i was reading a diary 
Like the story itself felt very like someone writing it. Like the whole thing, not just the diary bit, but the whole story kind of felt very like pieced together in a journal. All right. So let's rate it. One out of ten. Um, what should we do? Uh Bostonians? How about uh dark black roses? How about one out of ten black roses? Or right. lilies. Ah. Lilies? Okay. Because her name is Lily and she had lilies and he bought her the lilies. Okay. The lily, the lilies. So lilies right. I like lilies. Just one out of ten then. How what if we did um Hmm. Cringes. Okay. One out- <laughs> Fine. <laughs> one out of ten cringes. Well, that makes me feel like I should rate it very high on the cringe <laughs> scale. So no, let's just do lilies. Okay. Uh, two, two, mm. two, two, two lilies. Two is very generous. I'm gonna go with one. I absolutely hated this book, and I for it sure was, it was one. It, out. it was one before I read the author's note, and then. That did sway me a bit. It was actually zero at the beginning of the book. Then, like I said, two-thirds of the way through, when I started to see what was happening and that she was doing her best, I gave her one for that. Mm -hmm. Author's note, give her another one. So two. And you give it... One. And that is because she wrote it from the heart. (laughs) You know? And I I don't want to give it none. Yeah. But I really hated the book. Um, Yeah, and she treated such sensitive topic so casually like the very beginning when she was just thinking about suicide and she's not even suicide you know right yeah so it's just like this casual thing and that's a big thing it's not a casual anyways yeah we belabored this long enough yeah all right so are you throwing it out i'm definitely throwing it out and i'm with you that's probably the last coho book um yeah i'm done all right but let's let's get some let's get into coho in the bookend Okay. All right. Okay. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you some questions about Colleen Hoover. Oh. And you're going to guess the answer. I'm going to give you multiple choice to make it easy. Okay. All right. So here's the first question. All How right. How many books has Colleen Hoover published? Is it A, 21, B, 27, or C, 15? 15. The answer is actually 21, mm. but I would have given you credit for 27, assuming that you would have counted her various novellas. <laughs> okay. What was Colleen hey. Hoover? Here's yeah. an interesting question yeah. that I've always wondered. When there's a book title, mm-hmm. and then after the title, it says a novel. Mm-hmm. What makes a book have that after it? Because there's plenty of novels that don't say a novel. I think primarily it's just a publisher's call. But what what's the criteria? I think a novel has to be over 50,000 words or something, 60,000 words. It's a length issue. Yeah, but there's plenty of novels that don't say... The title and then a novel. I think that's the publishers. I just want to understand it. I mean, I don't know. Does, okay. I don't know the answer to that question. But if I had to guess, I would say it's because that's what the publisher decided to do. I, I mean, I want to ask our listeners, but we've asked our listeners before and they never, never respond. Okay. What was Colleen Hoover's job before she became a novelist? Was it A, retail? <laughs> she was a neurosurgeon. B, social work <laughs> or C, chef? I'm going to say retail. The answer is actually B, social work. She oh, my a, God. She has a bachelor's. That makes it even worse. She has a bachelor's degree in it. That makes it even worse. She had various teaching and social work jobs before becoming a full-time author. All right, next oh question. My God, Colleen. What was Colleen Hoover's debut novel? Was it A, Slammed, B, Point of Retreat, or C, This Girl? This Girl. Slammed. <laughs> I know her so well. <laughs> and fun fact, she published she published this novel to to give her mother something to read on her new Kindle. So her Aww. mother bought a Kindle, and so she published her book on the. I mean, I self published. I do right? respect the relationship she has with her mom and her stepdad. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and her and her real dad. I mean, the author's note was fantastic. How many spots did Colleen Hoover's novels have on the top ten of USA Today's bestseller list? In December of 2022. Three. It's either A, four, (laughs) B, seven, or C, two. I'm going to say four. That's correct. It had four of the top (laughs) ten spots. Number one, it starts with us. Number five, it ends with us. Number six, Verity. And number seven, Ugly 
Ugly Love. It also had number 11, Reminders of Him, and number 18, November 9, number 31, Regretting You, 35, Confess, 36, All Your Pre Perfects, number 54, Verity's Collectors Edition, and number 76, Hopeless. She has sold over 20 million I books. do not understand America. Okay. Which of these tidbits are true? In 2022, Hoover held six of the ten spots on the New York Times Best Paperback Fiction seller list. Probably true. Coho's novel Hopeless reached number one on the New York Times Best Sellers list, maintained it for three weeks, and is the first self-published novel to ever receive that honor. Probably true. <laughs> and then it starts with us is Simon & Schuster's most pre-ordered book of all time. Oh, God damn. I'm so afraid of all of them. I'll be happy if, is this a trick question? Because if they're all true, I'm going to cry into my pillow. And lastly, Colleen Hoover's novel Slammed won a Goodreads F Choice Award for Young Adult Fiction in 2012. That's the false one. That is actually the false one. She was only nominated. She did not win. The rest of them are true. Goodreads, I love you. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, she has one. Uh, Just not that one. <laughs> What is happening in the world? What I'm saying is that people love Colleen Hoover. It's taking, it's replacing soap operas. If I look at it through that lens, I'm okay. Okay. We don't have soap operas these days. I don't think. Yes, they still do. Do they? Mm -hmm. New soap operas? Or I think just... General Hospital and One Life to Live are still in the air. But there's no new ones. You mean like brand new ones that just came out? Yeah. Well, I mean, some, I mean, like there are TV shows. That are soup poppery. But like daytime. Yeah. General Hospital, One Life to Live. And that's it. What's on the, in the daytime? NBC's got like Days of Our Lives. But these are all. They're still around. Probably the same actors. Uh... Yeah. Yeah, but. Um, okay. All right. So I just want to remind our listeners that our next. Mm -hmm. uh, that was the end of the weekend? Yeah. Our next. Um. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, I could go on about Colleen Hoover. There's so I mean, who many couldn't? many detailed facts to talk about her. Um, our next uh, episode is going to be on October 27th, and it's going to be the Edgar Award winner. Um, Notes on an Execution. By Danya Kukovka. No. Kukovka. 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 Danya Kukovka. Notes on an Execution. I'm very excited about that one. But until next time. Eat the books eat, But I mean <laughs> Eat some good ones <laughs> uh.